audience as well after that. Uh, T.M. Krishna is a, a famous Carnatic vocalist, writer, activist, and author. As we know, he began performing at the age of 12 uh, with his debut concert at the Spirit of Youth series uh, organized by the Music Academy Chennai. And uh, he has performed widely at various festivals and venues across the world. Um, and he also speaks and writes about a wide range of issues beyond music and culture. And in fact, I've been a big fan of his writing for quite some time now. Um, but if you, and one of the things that I've actually loved about his writing were his pieces in the caravan on um, uh, MS and her, and her life and her music. Uh, but he has written widely on various subjects that intersect arts, culture, caste, gender, and politics. Uh, all of you, I'm sure, are aware of his works on uh, the history of Mridangam makers, uh, on reshaping art, uh, on the Southern music of an artic story, which, uh, which is a, an excellent book uh, in this genre. Um, and uh, one of the reasons we uh, called him here to talk to you uh, is because we wanted to give um, our students, uh, Krishna, these are incoming students, uh, first years in law, uh, at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level. Uh, but certainly at the undergraduate level, um, they would be doing a lot of uh, what we call liberal arts subjects in the first three years of their legal study. Something that I went through as well uh, when I was a student at the National Law School many years ago. And uh, for me, the law was, uh, was something that I knew I'll study, but I was really taken aback by the Kind of complexity and challenges uh, and fascinating domains in the liberal arts subjects that I studied uh, in the law school. Uh, and, I, uh, and I'm using that word widely. Uh, we, when we studied history, political science, sociology, economics, um, and, and, and other subjects related to that, some of my most fascinating conversations in the class and in my papers as well were to do with these subjects. And I wanted um, someone like you to address the students and talk to them a little bit more about uh, liberal arts. On the one hand, liberal arts and its role in education and in our lives, on the one hand, and also give them some idea, if it's possible, about your own journey through these issues and uh, your own life as it took shape uh, while uh, in, along with your uh, music. So thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, hearing Sorry, Krishna, before you start, I just want to mention that logistically, I just thought we, uh, uh, you can talk for, say, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, okay. and then we can have a Q&A session. Sure. Perfect. Uh, well, I'd like to first thank you for inviting me. Um, I felt like a bit of an oddball in the list of speakers. Uh, so thank you very much for considering me as someone who can address students um, who are entering the world, or should I say the legal world. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to have this chat. Um, you know, um, I was thinking of myself in college and I couldn't remember much of myself in college. That's the truth. So let me start from the real fact that is I, I did BA economics. That's the other side of me. Uh, don't ask me how well I did. I managed the course for three years and I, um, I passed. And I had, I'll start from there because I had this choice. I had this incredible passion for economics. I just love the subject and I still love it. And uh, I was, you know, potting around with this idea of, uh, I had this trajectory for me, uh, Delhi School of Economics, uh, LSC, and that was this, that was that side. That's a, that's a side I really wanted to pursue. And then there was music, uh, which I started early in life, which I'll speak about. And I had to kind of make a choice at that point of time and decide, well, am I going to take up music or am I going to, uh, you know, spend the rest of my life in economics? And I decided that music was my calling. Um, the reason I'm saying this is irrespective of what we choose or what, our, what is chosen, we, we do things for many reasons. Uh, many, of you, many of you here are, have chosen this course for many reasons. You, I would not say everybody is chosen for the same reason. Um, but why do we do something is something we have to ask ourselves, if not immediately, but at least at some point in time. So, because otherwise, I mean, you can all pass with grades, you can all do well, you can all become lawyers. Okay. 
But so what would be my straight question to you? Because what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And what is your internal relationship with what you're doing? That to me is a very, very crucial question to be asked. What is your relationship with it? And it is not about you knowing the law well, it is not about you winning cases, it's not about et cetera. So I think when we ask that question, our, our, the way we learn what we learn changes qualitatively. The questions that we ask change. And what you become later in life also changes. I'll tell you why I'm saying this. I started learning music when I was maybe five, six years old. It was not my choice, obviously. Um, I was told I could sing a few lines. So my mother put me in what you would call in Tamil party class or music class. And uh, I started learning. Um, I would rather be playing cricket on the street than going for music class. But I still learned because you were told thrice a week. I remember Monday, Wednesday, Friday were the days. I still remember it. And five o'clock was the class. I went for it. Um, I never thought I'm going to be a musician. When I was 12, I, I got onto the stage for this the first time. I still didn't, didn't think it was a big deal. And I, finally, I did make the choice. I, and I realized at some point that this was something I just loved doing. I mean, I didn't need a stage. I just like singing. And I said, well, I'm going to sing. But we're talking about the late 80s and early 90s. Nobody knew whether you could make a profession of it. You know, could you have livelihood of it? Luckily, I came from privilege and my father was nice enough to tell me, you know, give it a shot. If it doesn't work, get back to study. So I could, I had that liberty. Anyway, long story cut short, I sang, I got concerts, I traveled the world, I, what, you know, I uh, released albums, everything is fine. There is, uh, everything is absolutely hunky-dory. I was making money and I was, at one time, the rising star in Carnatic music, et cetera, et cetera. But then something changed around the millennium, around 2001, 2002. Because what I am today is not what I, I was then. I, I, my whole thought process has changed, my whole personality to a large extent, today, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about this. What changed? Why did it change? It's something I think about later. So around 2000, 2001, I was successful. As a musician, I knew how to make everybody happy. Uh, I had full houses. Uh, everything was fine. I was, I, was traveling, I was traveling on tours. What else is there to do? I mean, what else is there to do? I could do that for the next 40 years of my life, learn more complicated compositions, maybe do things that other people have not done, etc. Why I'm placing all this, I want you to consider all this in the domain that you are in. Uh, don't think of it as a musician speaking. Think of it in your own domain. You can master everything. Yes, you can go on. You can, you can go on. You can go on. But for some reason, I paused. I paused because I felt that I had cracked it all. And if this is all it is, there seems to be something wrong with what I was doing. If I could just go on just singing and, you know, it's not just about making money. Don't think it's about just making money. It's about what you're doing, the quality of what you're doing, right? So I, I paused and I said, okay, I need to find out where this is all coming from. Where's this music coming from? You know, people tell me it's old. People tell me this is how people sang. This is culture, etc. So I said, let's go really figure it out for myself. Uh, somebody has your microphone on. Just mute yourself, please. Okay, perfect. Um, and that's when I started actually reading musical history. And I must warn you that I was not a reader till then. I never read so many books. I'm not, don't imagine me to be a person like from 10, 15, 16, who, you know, uh, literally swallowed books. No, I did. I started reading. I read history. I read uh, treatises with the help of scholars. I went back and I was wondering, okay, what is this music? Why am I singing it? Who is singing it? Now, the most interesting thing about asking these questions, and I think that's where this word liberal arts, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a word within the Indian context that can be problematic because we don't like both those words, liberal and arts in the Indian context, right? And you put both those words together and say it's important and serious, most people will not believe you. If you said mathematics and science, everybody knows it is important, it is serious. I mean, there's no, the sound itself scares you, right? Everybody here will agree. If I say mathematics, it's scary. If you say liberal arts, it's loose. Yeah, yeah, I know these guys just go on these field trips and then make notes and then probably write a few papers. 
a peer review quality is very bad. You know, I've heard this hundred times, so I know. So anyway, you know, those words are itself, you know, it's interesting how just the sound of a word gives you meaning. You don't even have to know what liberal arts is. In fact, most people, are, you ask them to define liberal arts, they cannot, but it gives you a certain reflection. So, you know, when I was uh, reading all these things and I was singing, everything is liberal arts, right? I was music, which is an extension of liberal arts. I was reading history. I was reading treatise. I was, then I bumped into sociological uh, texts. And I'm none of these things. I'm not a master of any one of these things. The only thing I'm good at is singing. And I was dabbling with all these things for no reason but selfish. I wanted to know for myself. I wanted to know why am I singing? Is there any meaning to what I'm singing? When I say meaning, I do not mean making somebody happy. I mean, is there value? Is there value? Is somebody taking back something? And when I read everything, my whole world collapsed. I've never phrased it like this before today, but it did collapse. Why it collapsed was I realized that I was living in this bubble, a very, very good bubble. But that bubble burst. And when the bubble burst, I realized that the music I was practicing, the person I was, who I was talking to, who I wouldn't talk to, the person I didn't even notice on the street, were all part of who the music that I practiced. Were all being reflected in the way I sang, in my body language, in what I did not see, what I did see. This was a very important phase in my life because it really, really changed the way I saw myself, my music, and my relation, that music's relationship with the larger world. Right. And the reason I'm saying all this is you guys are doing law. And, you know, well, there are, there are experts here who know law. But law belongs to me too. It's not their, 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 their ownership. Let's be very clear here. Lawyers don't own law. You're facilitators of something. The question is, what are you facilitating? Can you ask yourself that question? What are you facilitating? I don't own music. I'm a catalyst for music. What am I catalyzing in the process? That's why I'm asking you this question. Because as an outsider, I think, you know, right, and funnily, I have right next to me the Constitution of India. This is what I have right next to me. Now, I can look at it and say, my goodness, these are words that I don't even understand and throw it away. And you're going to, I'm going to say, I need a lawyer. I don't need a lawyer. I don't need a lawyer. How is a lawyer going to create a relationship between this book and every citizen of this country? That is your job. Your job is to create a relationship that this book has with every person in this land. And if you want to create that relationship, you cannot do it by just reading law. You will fail. You have to do it by learning about people. If you, if you were going to define science, you know, as a way of, say, shall we say, understanding the natural world, its structures and behavior. I think what we would say about liberal arts and including law is the way of understanding our own quality of people, the quality within it. So it is the quality of the human being, quality of the relationships, the quality of the listening, the quality of the way we see, the quality of our relationship with nature. That's what we're exploring. That is exactly what you're exploring in liberal arts. Because it's not enough if you know how a machine operates. You have to know your relationship with that machine. And what are you two together doing in society? So, you know, in continuation of this, you know, music, because I, I do that, that's, that's what I do is often seen as this luxury or this ad addition to society. You know, extracurricular activities. We love that word in schools in India, extracurricular. So when the moment we say that, we say it cannot, it is not curricular. And then if that subject is added in 11th and 12th, how can an extracurricular activity become a subject? It means this guy is no good at anything else, right? If somebody chooses English literature, there must be a problem with literature. Uh, unless the person becomes a superstar at some point in time. 
But you know, why do we do music? Why do we paint? A lawyer needs to know that. If you're going to talk about privacy in your life, you have to know the privacy of an artist. You will never understand privacy if you don't know the privacy of an artist. There's no way you will understand anything that you read in law unless you also see the quality of that in the domains that we, that we call liberal arts. So as a, you know, as, a, as a musician, as a singer, we think music is something of enjoyment. Of course it is enjoyment. You do please people. But an artist is pleasing somebody, but the artist is saying something to us. Not just in the song. My existence says something. Why do we need art? Let's go to a fundamental question. Let me just flip back. Why do we need music, dance? I mean, it's, I mean, we don't need music, dance, drama, and society, do we? Why do we need it? We'll all survive without it. You can do other things. So the first question is, why did our species start scribbling things on walls and caves, start singing tunes? Why? Making instruments? Why? Just to feel better after a hard day's work? No. We have to give ourselves some more credit. We did because we, I think, I've said this many times, I think we realized that art allows for a certain opening that surprises even us. And all of us know this, everybody, there are about 115 people in this room, all of you know. You, I'm sure you listen to any, some kind of music. You may paint, you may just, you may do so many things. And you know that there are times you don't just feel happy listening to the music. You know, you may say you're lost in it. What do you mean by lost in it? Have you ever thought about it? What do you mean by lost? Can I try reframing it slightly differently? And say, you say you're lost in it because I think you're slightly better as a person at that time. Just for that period of time when you're lost in that song, you're not the person who hates you're not the person who discriminates. You're not the person who, who feels angry about things. You're just a person who is at peace. In, and peace can be of different sorts. And I think human beings discovered that much, much before we can imagine. So whether it's a design, whether it is a song, whether it is a movement, whether it's dance, theater, plays, we realize we can tap into some quality within ourselves, which also means we can shake us, shake, shake us, shake each other, which also means we can ask difficult questions. You watch a film that disturbs you. You don't sleep at night. You know, it's all, it's all a movie. It's not real, right? You know it. You cry when somebody dies in a film. Why? It's after all an act. Have you ever asked yourself that question? And you know, it's an act. That's the amazing part of art. It's not like you're being, it's not a fraud being put on you. You know it, you know the X is an actor, you know Y is the actor, you know the stabbing is false, you know the blood is just red ink, you know everything and yet you cry. Why do you cry? You laugh, why do you laugh? That's, that's the stunning part of it. You do it because in that experience, you, you're able, it, it, it asks questions of you. You're able, it asks, it reminds you of things. It, fast, it, it brings you to a place where you can actually, in fact, in some ways, deal with an issue which you cannot deal with in the real world. When you read a poem that asks difficult questions, it's an easier place for you to ask, your question, ask those questions of yourself, isn't it? Rather than a friend or rather than a situation on the street. Because there it's a battle. Here it's an image that allows you to think. So the liberal arts is about thinking, about how does one think? How does one create spaces to be, to be able to be better, to be thoughtful, to ask questions? And to me, that is the heart of what we all need to do in life. We all need to do in life. And so, you know, we, we underestimate the idea of the question itself. You know, we, we think that asking a question is the easiest thing in life. It's, the, it's a very difficult thing. You can ask questions and you can ask questions. And when you think about something and ask questions, then it leads to some movement in you. So I think the most important quality that I would, I would, I would see 
in students or I would ask students to try and, and cultivate is the ability to actually ask questions, actually listen and ask questions. Because the step you're taking today in your life is a step where it's, which needs to be something more than getting a degree or getting qualified. Because that will determine what you do or how you do what you do with your life. So look at my life now. I started asking questions about why I was singing in about 2000. And that led to an enormous change of everything that I do. The kind of, the way I sing music, where I sing music, why I sing music, the questions that I asked of myself in the world that I operate in, everything changed. It gave me strength that I never had before. The books that I write or the articles that I write all come from this quality that I stumbled on. And the quality was to be able to be open, ask questions and realize that we are not functioning for something. We are functioning because we are part of something much, much larger. We are facilitators of conversations which are much larger. So whether you're singing a song, whether you're reading an article, whether you are whatever else you may land up doing after this, this, these courses, you are part of, part of something larger and you have to see yourself that way. Um, finally, I want to say one thing. You know, you're, you're, you may imagine, see, the way we learn music in India or art, most, most arts in India is a non-academic world in the sense it's not institutional, for what I meant to say. So I learned music privately. I learned it in a music class. Um, and the atmosphere there was not very different from what would be a regular school in India. So I learned music and I came home. Uh, I learned what I needed to learn to be a good musician and I came home. So in a way, I don't think the music itself actually taught me to ask questions. This is why I'm, why I'm saying this. Don't think that just because you learn, just because I'm an artist and this, and also this belief that artists are all free bird, free thinkers, is all nonsense. Don't believe on that. We are just like anybody else. We are just like everybody else. So even artists need to have an attitude, need to cultivate that attitude. So I never got this in my music class. So where did I get it? I got it at my home. I got it at the school I studied. That is why my, my music changed, not because I learned music. Because of the environment that I was at school and at home, and that they allowed me to be able to explore so many other things in life, so many other conversations, so many other books, that allowed me to then even ask questions of the music that I sang. So I'd just like to conclude, I think I've spoken for about 20 minutes as promised, is that right? That's I'd right. like, to, yeah, I'd just like to conclude by saying, if there is one word in the Indian constitution that I think is most important, that's the word fraternity. Uh, and I would like to end with that word uh, because we are, if we really want to keep the promise or the hope that fraternity is what we seek, then you have to see your learning of liberal arts, of law, of everything else around it, of a song, of painting, all being a part of that endeavor to stay together. That's the only reason you can do what you do. You have to believe we stay together. And I don't mean this in some kind of a nationalistic sense. I mean it in the sense of humanity. And it's not just humanity extends beyond human beings. It means the trees, the lakes, the birds, and the animals. We have to, the fraternity is not human being centric. It is about this world and this planet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Krishna. That was uh, uh, really inspiring. In fact, your last uh, sentence, your last um, phrases about fraternity 
uh, just reminding me because yesterday I was just randomly going through uh, some of uh, some old articles and I chanced upon an excerpt from uh, Dr. Ambedkar's speech to the at the end of the Constitution making. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a brilliant speech. Yes, it's a brilliant and speech. and the emphasis he places on fraternity there yeah. uh, in his speech reminded me of what uh, you were saying. So uh, I think. Um, the one thing that I really was uh, struck by, uh, and some of that is reflected in, in the chat box as well, and I'm going to ask you about that, is, um, the idea, is the idea that there's some kind of transformation that people can go through, whatever they're doing. You are, it's for you, it's art. For the students coming in, it's law. And that transformation itself uh, makes them reassess their relationship with whatever domain they are in. Uh, for you, it was art. I'm hoping for the students who are coming in here, it's the law uh, through their uh, studying of politics and economics and history. Uh, and, and, and some of the questions that I'm seeing here are a little bit about that. Um, so one question is about, you know, you, you, met, you, you had a striking phrase in the beginning, you said your world collapsed, um, you know, at some point of time around 2000, 2001. And, uh, and then you um, had to redefine yourself in some way. And the question was, and the question from the students is that, uh, what was this process of redefining yourself? In some ways, uh, uh, Krishna, you're re redefining yourself acted out in the public domain. I think yeah. it, it, it's publicly known how, how you know, what you yes. did. But I just want to ask Unfortunately you, so, to... but go ahead. <laughs> no, but so it's an important- There's a bit more about it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so what does it mean when, the, when I say the world collapsed? See, all of us grew up with a set of belief systems, okay? Uh, all of us, do. There, could, there could be some commonality in some of our systems, some, there could be some divergence also. And our definition of who we are, where we belong, what you want to do, what you want to become, what your role in society is entirely defined by that, by that set of belief systems. Now, you could argue with me, many of the students could say, but that belief system keeps changing. It's not exactly true. Let's be a little more careful with that. There are some fundamentals of the belief, belief system that never goes away. Right? You may, there are negotiation spaces because we also realize that there are transactions in society required. We can't be without transacting with things even we don't like. So in order to enable transactions, there are certain openings we allow. Then we add on to the belief system with more exposure, with more children. But very rarely will we go to that foundational belief system and say, this needs to break down because I think this is unethical or I think this is wrong. What we generally will say is, no, it's actually good. We've understood it wrong. Because that's a, more, that's a safer space to be, right? So when I said it collapsed, I fundamentally felt a lot of my belief systems were unethical. Who I was, was not how I should be in, 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 a, in, in a modern world. Um, and that meant, also meant, I was asking those questions, the music I said, right? Uh, or what I was sharing. Everybody's happy with it. I was wondering, everybody's happy, but at least the people in the auditorium are happy. So my job is to make people happy. Why am I even bothering about this? But it collapsed because it bothered me deep here inside. That, you know, I can't be blind to the complexity of this. Another thing I want students to watch for, watch for is, you know, the world is not black and white. Not the world, even these things are not black and white. It's not like everything is, it's not about being evil or being good. It's about recognizing that you're gray. There's a huge difference between the two. So you realize that your belief system is in the gray area half the time, right? At one, at some, shall we say in certain context, it seems to make, you say, there's nothing wrong with this, it's fine. And you shift the context and it seems to be a horrible thing. But the truth is, it is completely gray. Now, the moment you recognize that, you see you need to reconfigure everything. Now, that requires courage. That requires inner strength to be able to do it. But that inner strength only comes from fortifying yourself with learning. It doesn't come, it's not something that is innate in you. Please, and I don't even believe this innateness. It's always the context that is deciding if something is possible or not. For some people, it's much harder. If you come from communities where oppression is an everyday happening, then what courage am I talking about? This whole thing is, is ridiculous, isn't it? So it's the environment. So 
in whatever you learn, you may come from privilege, you may come from a position of comfort, but you have to understand these different contexts of all these operations and then your belief system is in trouble. Because you realize that this, there's nothing universal about it. You realize that you have to interact with these different things. You realize that some things you do may be just simply wrong. That also. So, I mean, once, you know, it was not like a moment of eureka, of learning where I said, wow, I figured this out of myself. No, it happened for a period of time. But it was a struggle for two reasons. You know, uh, you know, Nikam spoke about it was in public. You know, the public is the second problem. The problem is first yourself. Because I am, am I sure I want to do this? Am I sure I want to disturb myself? And even you start making those changes, you're not comfortable with it because that you think is not you. So I struggled with my own changes first. I was not comfortable. I was finding ways to negotiate. And then in my profession, you had an audience, you had public. And I was also writing, it was not just singing, right? Who came up and said, this whole thing is rubbish. This guy is here to destroy this great culture and art. He's going to throw it down the drain. So you had that coming right up at me on my face. And it was, a, it was not, you know, it was not an easy time. I was, I think uh, it'll, be, it'll be honest for me to say is that I think I had enough strength and privilege to handle it. But it's also true, it's lonely at times. I mean, that's also true. When everything is at you on an everyday basis, from anybody and everybody you know, there are moments at 10 p.m. where you're, it's up to here. And you may have family, they all may be with you, but it's still you who is facing the music, literally. So how does one deal with that? How do you overcome that? Or how do you let it pass? I think the strength for that goes back to some universal qualities of humanity that we have to believe. The strength for that goes back to the fact that we do believe in certain ethics. We do believe in conversations. We do believe that we do believe in equality. We do believe in all those words, right? And I think that is what helped me. Helped me move fast. Of course, friends, that's true. But I think on a personal level, I think that's really what helped me. That I believe that beyond all this, it's possible. And which also means you will make mistakes. Just because you're in this journey, don't think you're always right. You would be wrong. You will make mistakes. But yet, you have to allow this to drive you in whatever you do. Thank you. Actually, that, your last comment echoes a series of comments made by our previous speakers as well about the importance of community uh, and the fact that you know, law school is a community as well. And then the music uh, um, domain is also a community. It's not just one person doing something. Yeah. It's a group of people doing it. And, 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 and then you, you kind of draw uh, power and support from each other. Uh, that, I think that's an important point, uh, Krishna, that you're making. Um, uh, one um, follow-up question about your, um, your efforts to uh, do, do some things different. Uh, the question is, while writing from a student, the question is, while writing Sebastian and Sons, how did you grapple the idea with the idea that you would again be a privileged person writing about the marginalized? And I'm sure this is something not just about Sebastian and Sons, but about a lot of other work on cast. And oh, the... it's that, uh, that's, you know, just for people who don't know uh, Sebastian and Sons, to quickly tell you, um, it's the book I, pub which was published last year, uh, a book on investigating the work, the knowledge and the social complexity of the communities that make the Mridangam. Mridangam is of course a primary instrument in Carnatic music. Uh, most of the makers come from Dalit communities. The Mridangam is played by Brahmins and there comes the uh, very, very uncomfortable uh, reality. So you have this instrument on stage proclaimed to be that played by the gods, worshipped, everything, but the makers come from the edges of society. Then there's another complexity. You need cow skin, buffalo skin, and goat skin to make the mridanga. And before anybody tells me it's dead cow, dead goat, dead buffalo, no. Cows are chosen. Buffaloes are chosen. Goats are chosen. Those chosen goats, the chosen skin is used to make these instruments. Now you can see the whole dimensions 
of equality, caste, everything appearing in that relationship. You have relationship. You have Mardangam players having a relationship with Mardangam makers, a complicated relationship. Now, that's the book. Uh, basically explores it through the last whole century and looks at, the, you know, how are these social things negotiated? What about knowledge, etc.? cetera? Um, you know, that is one of those questions that I has still don't have a good answer for. I can just say one thing. If you read the book, you would see that I am struggling with it even in the book. And I, I put out that in the book itself, uh, whether I'm asking the wrong questions, whether I have a right to ask some of these questions, because I come from caste privilege, economic privilege, uh, gender privilege, name it. I have all the privileges that you can take off in this country. And I'm going to people who are making Mardangams and asking them these questions. That's the first discomfort in that whole endeavor. Why? Why am I asking these questions? Then the second, who am I to write their story? Who am I to come there and write their story? Do I have even a position to write their story? Two, three, after writing the story, who gets all the awards? TM Krishna gets the awards. They still remain where they are, right? So you can see the messiness that that entire book is, but that's the reality of the book. And I'm not, I'm not here to run away from it. I'm not here to find excuse, but that's true. So why do you still do it? Now, here is what I can propose, and you don't need to accept it at all, is in the case of the Mridhagam makers specifically, the truth is that even among the communities that are marginalized, very few people even know that these people exist, except those who are within the world of Karnataka. This is a reality. Why do I write this book? You write this book with the hope that you have encouraged a conversation. Your hope is that you're an amplifier that you amplified this discussion, spotlighted these people, and then you get out of that space. And then the conversation has to proceed. The conversation has to happen. Now, I cannot continue that conversation post that. Yes, I do, it does accrue benefits for me, but the question is, do I know when to move out of that space? Is it changing their lives? Am I, am I looking at that post that? Am I in relationship with the makers to see if their lives are changing? Are their relationship with the Mardagam players changing? I'm happy to tell you that it is changing. After the book, it has changed. I know, maybe marginal. These things take sometimes decades to happen, but I know they're changing. I know the conversations that never happened before happen. So you are happy that you kind of allowed that, but then you just move back. I'm hoping that a day um, soon a Mardagam maker would write, the, write a book and probably say T.M. Krishna is wrong. I don't agree with what he said that should happen. So it is a complicated space, knowing when not to speak. This is not very different from, say, for example, the feminist conversation, right? Uh, when, does a man, when should a man know to just keep quiet and listen? It's the same thing. When should an upper caste person know that it's time to just keep quiet? So it's one of those things that there's no right answer for, but just Thank you for reminding me of the questions because I need people to constantly remind me of that. This answer that you gave might have answered a very interesting question I have in the chat box. But I think what you said just now might have at least partly answered that already. But I, I think the question is still worth asking, the one that's been asked here, which is that um, uh, uh, the question is this. Uh, the art, the, what you said today about art, appears to suggest that art is something more than just entertainment. It's something that helps us see the real universal. It serves as a mirror to ourselves and our own natures. And the question that we ask here is, do you have an example of this from your own art? Um, in addition to what you just not said about Mridangam. Uh, well, I, I can, uh, I, well I, I can just show you, I, I can give you examples of some few things we did uh, to to kind of highlight it. I can show you two, uh, let me show, uh, tell you two examples. One would, what would be called from the tradition itself, rather from the ages bygone. And one could be something we did to just show you what it tells you. You know, um, often Carnatic music, for example, there's a very musical example, but I want to give it, uh, I will explain it in detail, those who don't know music. You know, Carnatic music is associated with religiosity, right? being religious music, for example. Uh, because the words that are sung are all based on uh, Hindu gods and goddesses. There's no question about that, no debate. Now, I'm just going to add one dimension to this. 
because the words are gods and goddesses, they're religious. So, for example, is there a difference between me singing bhajans and me singing a Carnatic song? Both are religious. Both could be based on some raga. What's the difference? If it's the same as that, then there shouldn't be any differentiation, right? It should be the same. So, what I would argue is something very interesting is that if you go back to the compositions of the great musicians, great composers, you do find that they didn't, I mean, why was it religious? Because their social context was religious. These composers belong to Brahmin communities within small clusters who had a certain set of belief systems like you and I have. Their words will only reflect that belief system. It's not going to, leave to reflect any other belief system. So they did speak about Rama, Krishna, and also in a certain Brahmin context. That was what they knew and that was their life. So we shouldn't be surprised. But were they only doing that? Is an interesting question. Because if you analyze their compositions, you see that they were not only doing that. They were pushing the extents of even breaking words. Breaking words to an extent where you were not to understand the word. You were not to know the meaning, unless I told you this is the word. Can you tell me why a composer who is so hell-bent on being only religious, if that was his intention, would break a word so much that you don't understand the word? You have to give him some more credit. Then why was he doing it? So it told you about his nature. It told you two things. His social context is that. So it allows you to reflect on his social context. But also tells you that the social context is not everything for him. That he believes all that, but in his art, he's trying to say there is more to it. There is something more. It's not just in the word meaning. Maybe it's in just the sound of the word. Maybe it's in the flow of the melody. So even in traditional art, as we call it, traditional music, we have, you have to see there is so much more happening. In, mu in music that is purely religious, whether it is bhajan or kavali or gospel, then there, there also you understand the, the community because you say, I want to feel the presence of that Lord in front of me. We all want to do it collectively. Give me music that does it. Simple as that. How different is it from political music? Not at all different, isn't it? Look at political songs. They do the exact the same thing. I want to feel that ideology in, um, amidst us. I want to make sure everybody believes it. Tells it does the same thing. I'll tell you another similarity between devotional music and, and political music. They're all rendered in simple tunes. Why? Because they want collective participation. They want everybody to sing, both political music and religious music. That's very interesting for us to think of in political terms, think of in liberal art terms. That is very interesting. That So the aesthetic quality of something also tells you something about the people, also tells you what is possible, allows you to think. My own example will be, I mean, there are a few. I'm gonna, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll choose one of them. Is uh, this is a song that's available on YouTube, so you can watch it. It's called Porumbo Kapadal. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. This is a song that uh, was written by this young Tamil rock musician. His name is Kevar Vasuki, and uh, it's a song that deals with the north of Madras, north of Chennai. Sorry, as it is known today, where there are about four thermal power plants. The life of the fisher folk there has been ruined. It's environmental disaster zone. And uh, fly ash, which is what comes out of thermal power plants, has filled 1,000 acres of what should have been mangroves. 1,000 acres. Now, it's, it's, a, it's, it's the ugliest place you can go to. It affects people's health. It affects their river. It affects everything. So we made this song to highlight that issue. Now, it was interesting in many ways. Uh, first, in most of these so-called classical forms of music, we never use the language that you and I speak. I'll never use it. Because if I use the word you and I speak, then the classical comes down in its degree of uh, positioning, right? So I only use language that is old or, or colloquial language which was 200 years ago because that now becomes acceptable. So this was probably the first time that an Indian so-called classical music, that the language that we speak on the street was going to be sung in ragas, okay? And that was an interesting experiment for us. Secondly, what is the subject we're talking? We're talking about environmental pollution, we're talking about the suffering of people, not something that you would hear in a classical concert. Two, three, the first word of that song. The first word of that song is porambok. 
If there are Tamilians here in this group, you know immediately what. If you're from Chennai, you definitely know what it means. Porumboka means good for nothing, useless fellow. Okay? It's an abuse word. But it has a legal connection. Legal connection comes here. It actually means commons, that is, which is shared. So it could be lakes, could be mountains, could be forests, could be, uh, I mean, could be our streets, right? Our road is common. Now, what happened during the British time is they had a problem with this Porumbo. Now, the Porumbo is not privately owned, so it became non-taxable. So there was no revenue generation from Porumbo spaces. Therefore, Porumbo started meaning useless, valueless, good for nothing. So something that meant commons changed to mean something has, that has no value because the state could not profit from it. Very simple. Now that then multiplies. It multiplies to meaning that not only is the space useless, but the people who live in that place also become useless, don't they? So Puramboku becomes an abuse. In any Tamil film today, you will find somebody telling somebody else Poramboka at least at, at least once in the film. Now, this Carnatic music song began with an abuse word, Poramboka. Now, that was very interesting for me to do because I couldn't imagine singing first in the language that everybody speaks, then to start with an abuse word. So, this is an example of the intersections that are possible and the learnings that are possible. So um, this is fascinating because there's a follow-up question by a, a student who's asking, um, you know, you opened up spaces, you're, you're experimenting with different art forms. Um, do you think that this will uh, ever reach scale? Have you seen a change in how the typical audience of classical arts perceives these interactions? Do you see more, people are more receptive to what you're trying to do? Well, I, I really think that they are, they are far better today than they were a decade ago when I started all this, for sure. I mean, I, I can definitely say that. See, the one thing uh, about change, especially when you're speaking about social cultural state change, is that the metri what metrics can you, can you actually apply to it? That's where the problem happens. You know, I mean, what kind of metrics, quantitative metrics are you going to, are you going to say? Are they five, you know, I, I mean, how many people are attending? How many musicians are engaging? Many musicians may engage, may not want to tell you they're engaging. Look at the complexity, right? They may have to wait for them to have enough gravitas and power to engage. See, this goes on. So what I do believe is I do see change. I do see change in the next generation, not in my generation. I don't expect it in my generation. But I think younger people, definitely I see change. And I think we need to give it time, give it a decade, give it 20 years. Because a lot of fascinating things are happening. It's not just me. You're also listening now to other art forms that have been that were in the margins pushing back and, and you know demanding center stage attention. So there is an interesting set of contestations that are happening in society, right? And I think this leads to definitely dynamic change. We need to give it a couple of decades for us to actually see it happening, you know. And I'm not so, and I do believe there are already enough signals that I see as a practitioner, uh, both in terms of um, reception and in terms of people who practice, that younger people are doing so many interesting things. I see it on Instagram. I see it on social media. You know, I, they are doing interesting things. They are trying interesting things. They're trying to find a way. And I, I always find it fascinating when I get emails from young people across and saying, you know, I want to try this. Can you just check this little video out? I tried this. And that's when you're like, okay, you're hopeful and say, okay, all things are not so bad. And I don't think they are. Do you, um, do you believe, this is a very interesting question I have with me, and I, I have a feeling that this question um, can be extrapolated to various other domains, and I'll, I'll explain what I'm trying to say here. The question from the student is, how do you separate art and the artist? How do we enjoy art created by people who might have very different beliefs, uh, or sometimes if these artists endorse something that we are completely against it? How do we separate the art and the artist? And I, can I just as an aside tell you that, I mean, you know, a lot of people I know, I'm always amused by the fact that a lot of people I know whose values are very different from yours, Krishna, enjoy your music immensely. <laughs> <laughs> and I know they struggle with it, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, I think, there are, I, think there are, I think there are grades to this. So I think we have to be, I'm going to be a little careful. I mean, there could be people you have difference of opinion with, but, um, you may not have a foundational ethical difference. You may have differences that are slightly at, at, at a, shall we say, 
more superficial layer. That's, I think, easy to negotiate. But I think it gets harder and harder when there are very fundamental questions of uh, humaneness, for example, uh, where you, you just don't see eye to eye. Even, and actually, I wrote a piece, it's available online for first post, where I wrote about Tyagaraja, um, Wagner, and uh, Roman Polanski uh, on this issue of the art and the artist. So if you get the time, just it's, on, it's on, online. But it's a, the question that I would rather ask is this. So there are these two absolute positions. One is the art and the artist are separate. Don't connect it at all. Uh, don't even bother about seeing the art, artist in the art or the art in the artist. That's one absolute. The other absolute is they are, you can't separate them. So if I hate the artist for what he or she or they stand for, then I hate the art. So you have this. So I just think that there is both these positions maybe require a little more rethought. So my question will be this. Suppose there's an artist whose movies or whatever you truly think add value to you, to whatever you do. But say the person is spouting uh, violent lines, saying things absolutely violent about another community, et cetera, et cetera. What do you do? You know, I just think that you should not negate both. So my question to you will be, if you listen to the same person's music or watch the same person's film, keeping alive what the person also says, then does the film change in the way you receive? Or rather, do you change in the way you receive the film? Meaning, while watching the film, you're keeping alive the nature of the individual also. So you're not saying, I will not watch the film. You can, you can push this even further. Say, suppose the, make, the artist is a sexual abuser. What do you do? What will you do? Will you say, I will not watch that person's film? Or will you say, let that film be blotted by the fact that this fellow is a sexual abuser? And I don't receive the film in that magical way I received it before, but it's tainted. And that taint is also important for me because it reminds me of how complicated even I am. Maybe there is a space for that. I am not factoring some very legal and very economic issues in this, obviously, uh, that, because that will that'll, that'll, complicates this conversation even more. But just on a very, very uh, ethical basis, I think there is a space for that. I like to grapple with it. You know, I like to, so I want to give you an example, which I write in that piece about a very interesting experiment. There is this um, um, Jewish uh, conductor, his name was Daniel Barenboim. He was a fabulous conductor, activist, uh, incredible man. And he did something quite, quite stunning at one concert in Jerusalem. So those who don't know, Wagner was basically considered Hitler's music or the music of the Nazi time Germany. So there is, it is, it is anti-Semitic. It's, it's sound itself, uh, I think, uh, triggers horrible uh, images in the Jewish community. So you have Daniel Barenboim performing in Jerusalem. He stops at one point and says, shall we play Wagner? Now, it can't get more political than that. He's sitting in Jerusalem and he's asking a Jewish audience whether we can play Wagner. And what he does is he engages in a little conversation. There are people who walk out, but there is a little conversation and then they play Wagner. Now, what, what was received when they heard Wagner at that moment? Not just the music, but the music with all the messiness that is there. And the music changes. Just remember when you hear music or when you do theater, you're not just receiving it directly from production to the end. You're receiving it through imageries of, that you have created in between because of who you are. And the, the more we play with those imageries, the way you receive changes. So I think there is a space in between for this conversation. No, I think that, that's right. I think we have um, one uh, uh, time for one last question. Um, and uh, this question is very intriguing. That's why I chose this question as the last question. Although I'm sorry, I can't have every question being answered uh, here. Uh, the question is, um, as an artist whose work and passions are subject to public scrutiny, how do you reconcile the divide between the way you see yourself and uh, the public perception of you, which is bound to be shaped by only one facet of you, which is 
the art that you made public and of course your public statements and your writings. Well, I don't think you should try reconciling the two at all. I mean, you cannot reconcile the two. You just have to be sure you don't see yourself the way the public sees you. That's a big trap. And that's both the positive and the negative. Huh? Don't think it's only the uh, negativity hurled at you. There is this immense positivity hurled at me. Right? I'm not any messiah. Some people will think that I have this, I have an answer to all these complicated questions. I don't have answers to all these complicated questions. If I start believing that, that's the end of it. So it's not just the negativity. The public view of positivity is also a problem. You have people writing reams about what they think about something you wrote or something you spoke or something you signed. It's very pleasurable and you should enjoy the pleasure. I'm not going to deny that. But you can't start believing that, right? If you start believing that, then you are then believing, again, choosing what to believe from public domain as yourself. So it's not as easy as I just put it now. Uh, there are days where you believe it. I can tell you honestly and anybody who doesn't tell you that are lying. There are days in which you believe it. But you must let those days pass. They shouldn't stay with you always. You know, the days in which you get incredible compliments from people, say, who, who you respect, are days when you believe really you've really you achieved something quite spectacular, man. It's serious. And then you get abuse also. And then those days you're, you're struggling with that. You're just like, you know, how, how do, the first question is, how is that they don't get what you say? I mean, that's the first reaction usually, isn't it? If somebody disagrees with you, it's like they didn't get it. And I think that the teenage, uh, there is a teenage expression that we all use, but I don't think it's restricted to teenage, is nobody understands me. But I'll tell you, it's a lifelong statement that we all believe. It's not anything to do with being 17, 18, 19, 20. Even 60 year olds believe nobody understands them. So don't ever believe that nobody, so you can't fall into all these traps. So you just have, the only thing you can call on yourself to be is honest and to yourself. And you just have to call on yourself to be that. So, you know, I'll give you one example. When, when something critical is written about me, uh, the first reaction is what it is. The person doesn't know what they are writing about or, or doesn't understand what I said, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but you know what happens? I've said this before. Is that generally what happens, there'll be three, four lines which will be a, a forceful critique. And you will basically diss the first two lines. And there'll be this one line which you actually would not be able to throw away. But you know, it's one of those things that will bother you deeply. So the first thing you will do is, shall we say, decide a good response to it in your head. So in your head, you had already actually written a letter to that person saying this line is wrong. And you know to yourself that that answer is not good enough because maybe there is just that one point in that line that you need to think about. So my suggestion to you is draft that and keep it, in a, keep it in a draft folder. Get up the next morning, open that article again, read it again, and open your drafted response and read it again. And you don't have to say it in public that you agree with what that person said. But as long as you do it to yourself, you're in good shape. This was uh, really uh, nice of you to come and talk to our students. Um, I feel that um, these talks really uh, serve the function of opening up some ideas, some conversations, some thoughts in the heads of our students uh, as they embark on um, what is going to be a challenging, rigorous, but hopefully enjoyable journey uh, for, uh, for the next uh, five years or one year as the case may be. Thank you very much, Krishna. No, thank you, Nigam. Okay. Thank you all uh, for giving me this opportunity to have this chat. And uh, I do hope that uh, all of you do wonderfully well and learn a lot and contribute to the institution too. I think both needs to happen. Thank you. Take care, all of you. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. For the rest of our audience, please don't leave yet. Yeah. We have uh, the vice chancellor is back with us and uh, he has a few words to say by way of closing. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, congratulations, you've survived the first week. Uh, we're at the end of Friday uh, and you're all set to begin your academic